So we are entering into the 10th week uh, of our study going through John's um, first epistle to the churches in Asia Minor. And uh, this morning we come to chapter 5. Looks like we're going to uh, conclude our study next Sunday. Uh, but this morning we're going to pick up in chapter 5. And um, just uh, last week, just a little review. Last week we focused uh, primarily on the subject of love. This is a, uh, a subject matter that John addresses, obviously, um, all throughout the epistle. In fact, the Word of God clearly um, uh, highlights the importance of the emphasis of love. Last week we looked at uh, God's love for us. Uh, we focused our attention on our love for God. We looked at the, the Trinity's love for us, right? The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all actively engaged in our salvation out of love uh, for us. And then we looked at our love in response to that, our love for others, right? That's, a, that's the extension, or the, that's the expression and the, the metric of our sincere love for God. The way in which we can manifest and demonstrate our love for God, John highlights for us, is by our expression of love for one another. John closes out that last, uh, that, that uh, text at chapter four by saying this, if anyone loves, if, if anyone says I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we've heard from him. Him who? Him, Jesus. Right? This is the commandment we've heard from Jesus. Whoever loves God must love his brother also. We see such a, such a high premium that God places on our love for one another. So much so that it becomes a measurable way of validating the authenticity of our faith. Right, the way in which we can know that we, are, that we are in the faith, that we are in Christ, will be seen in our love for one another. Our love for one another is not what secures our salvation. Our love for one another is what communicates that we have been saved, right? That we are in love with Christ and we have accepted God's free love, a uh, free gift of, of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Today's text will present another metric. We looked at love, but there's another metric that will help to answer the question that John raises in this epistle. What question is that? Namely, how do we know that we have eternal life? That's ultimately what John is doing in this text, in this epistle. He's raising the awareness of, of knowing um, how we are in the faith, right? There's, there's a uh, all kinds of miscommunication and error that's being spread out throughout the churches in Asia Minor. And John is letting them know, here's how you know that you are in the faith. And he gives some metrics all throughout. Last week, we looked at um, um, love as one of those metrics. Today, though, we see another metric that John will hold up, that being our obedience to God. And more specifically, the relationship between love and obedience. That's the title of my message this morning. The relationship between love and obedience. Because obedience needs to be driven by love and love needs to be demonstrated through obedience. There is, a, there is an inseparable um, relationship between love and obedience. John will demonstrate in our text that our, our sincere love for God will not only cause us to love others, but it will cause us to faithfully obey Christ's commands. We'll see that, again, that there's an inseparable connection between our love for God and our obedience to his commandments. Lest we think that it's just about love, we also need to recognize that love is an action word. And the link between love and obedience, the, set, the connection, is inseparable. Let's take a look at our text together. 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. John writes, If everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him, by this, we know that the, we, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. 
For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. Again, we see the, the connection between our love for God and those who are born of God, right? He says that in verse two, we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Those things cannot be separated one from another. And so John, again, in this chapter, re revisits the theme of love. And, and so I wanna point out, the, the first point I wanna bring out to you is this, that love is the foundation. Love is the foundation. A couple things we see here, and I don't wanna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on love this morning because we've, we've really spent a lot of time on it in, in, in the last number of weeks, but our love for God is inseparable from our love for one another. Now that sounds real good, but the reality of it is we need to live like we believe that. Our lives need to reflect that truth, not because I said it, but because that's what the scripture teaches. Our love for God is inseparable from our love for his children. Hey, are we any different than that? Imagine I said to you, hey, I really love you. I just, I hate your kids. No quicker way to create some distance between me and you than telling me you love me, but hate my kids. Why? Because my kids are a part of me. And if you can't love them, then you don't know me. You don't love me, right? And, and nothing, nothing can bring the best or worst out of us than when somebody assaults our kids. Well, here's what God is saying. Here's, don't say you love me and hate my kids. Because if you say that, you're a liar. Why? Because we're in union with him, right? And so the reality of it is there is a, there is a high premium that the scripture places on our love for one another. Why? Because it is, it, we are in union with Christ and we are the family of God. That's what John meant when he said in, 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 in verse 20 of chapter four, he says, if, I love, if, if anyone loves, says I love God and hates his brother, who's that? That's God's child. One of the greatest ways to kind of get over the person who bothers you, if they're a believer, of course, not that believers ever bother believers, I get that, right? Hypothetically speaking, of course, one of the greatest ways to kind of get over that hurdle is remember that you're speaking to God's daughter. You're speaking to God's son, whom God loves and cherishes as much as he loves and cherishes you. And when we start seeing each other through the eyes of God, through the lens of, 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 of that relationship that they have with God, you know what we find? That we'll have a little bit more tolerance for one another. So we see that love is the foundation. And we also see that love establishes the foundation for our obedience to God's commandments. Love establishes the foundation of obedience to God's commandments. In other words, love becomes the driving force behind obedience. Love becomes the driving force behind obedience. Second point I wanna bring out to you is this. Obedience is an expression of love. Obedience is an expression of love. Look at verse two. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. What John is doing is he's presenting the why behind obedience. Obedience is not something we do out of compulsion or guilt or shame or religiosity, but rather we obey out of a sincere love for God. In fact, this is the way in which we express our love for God. As I mentioned before, we certainly express our love for God in loving the brethren, and the reality is even that is an act of obedience, right? That's what we're called to do. But look what John says here. He says, obedience that is done from an expression of love is not burdensome. Listen, oftentimes those two words go together, burdensome and obedience. Why? Because we don't want to obey sometimes. Come on, right? Because often we want to do what we want to do, don't get in our way, and then somebody brings a scripture to us or we come across something that says that's not the right way. Don't do it. 
And that becomes burdensome. Unless, of course, we view that obedience as a response to our love for God. And John says, when you do that, love is not, obedience is not burdensome. How many times have you done things for people out of guilt or shame or, or obliga obligation? You don't need to raise your hand, right? But your heart just wasn't in it. You're know, like, I don't like this person. I can't believe I got I to. It's kind of like, you know, it goes down like a spoonful of bad medicine. It's just like, oh, do I really need to do that, right? But when it's somebody you love, when it's somebody you care for, right? It's someone who you're, you're connected with and they can ask you the most annoying thing, right? Like, like, hey, can you pick up my couch in the middle of the night and, and drive it over? You know, I heard you got a truck, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I love that. <laughs> Just, Seth's joke. Um, but when you, see, here's the deal. When, when, when you love that person, it truly is a privilege. It truly is an honor. It's truly, it truly is a, a, a joy to serve and, and to obey in that sense. And what, what, what we're looking at in the scripture this morning is the importance and the priority of obedience put in motion and driven by, by love and not compulsion. That's not how God wants us to obey him out of love and compulsion. In fact, just the opposite. When we, when we obey out of love for God, it's not burdensome. It's not, it's not done with clenched fists. But instead, out of, out of open hands. Yesterday was November 11th. My day, my special day. November 11th, 1989, God got a hold of my heart. I was far from God, drinking and partying and so far from what I knew to be true and on November 11th, 1989, I went to a service one night and God got a hold of my heart and turned me upside down and, and my life was forever changed. I, I had not, by the grace of God, I had not looked back one time in those 34 years. I told all my friends, guys, I'm not going, I, I, you're not gonna see me anymore. The partying's over, the drinking's over, the crowds, it's all over. I've, 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 I told them, I'm dead. It wasn't the most wise thing. I didn't say I was wise at, at, at 19 years old. Um, uh, but I was zealous. I was very zealous. And, and, but but, I, but my heart was in, in the right place. And, and I knew I had to follow hard after God. And I remember one of the things I did. I remember maybe a couple days afterwards, I became very aware of what needed to change in my life. Some things were really obvious, some things not so obvious. And I remember laying down on the floor of my room with a pen in my hand because nobody had those iPads back then. And I actually wrote, right? And I started to make a list of all the things I needed to change. Some of the things became very quick. It's like, all right, no more, no more drinking, no more partying, no more, you know, messing around. No more. Just, just, you know, all, the whole list of all the things. And then the attitudes that needed to change. And I started creating this long list. And then I looked at it. And I thought, there's no stinking way I can do this. And you know what? It was like at the moment that I looked at that list, I, I, I just have this picture in my mind. I remember being there and seeing this long laundry list of things that needed to change. Just as it gripped my heart with fear, it was like the Spirit of God said, why don't you just throw that away and just love me. And as you love me, I will change you in the process. And we will check off that, that list and so many others, right? As a result of what? My laundry list? Nope. As a result of me loving God. And you see, sometimes we get so caught up in all the things that we have to do that it gets in the way of what God is ultimately calling us to do. And what is that? Love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And you know what? By the grace of God, I look back, I've never gone back. I've never gone back. Why? Because I've got good willpower? I mean, my friends are like, listen, man, you'll be back, bro. You will be back. And you know what? It's been 34 years, and I've, where am I going to go? Right? I look back and see the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And it wasn't my willpower. It was nothing more profound than my simple love for Jesus. My simple love for Jesus. And I want to encourage you this morning, before you look and get discouraged over the long laundry list of things that you need to change, just fall in love with Jesus because there's a relationship between obedience and love. 
Love is what fuels our ability to obey. And that is what John is saying. Anything apart from that is sheer religiosity. When our obedience is not a burden, but, but a joy that is expressed out of love for him, it is, as John says, it's just, it's just not burdensome. It's not burdensome. And so as you like, anybody have to change anything in their life? All right, I, I know I need to change. Listen, there's, there's stuff that needs to change in my life, my, life, my life right now that weren't anywhere near that list, right, at the time, All right? But you know what? I'm just falling in love with Christ. And as I'm falling in love with Christ, not hypothetically, but literally, I pursue him. I go after him. I read and apply his words to my life and try to live them out to the best of my ability and by the grace of God. And as that happens, I'm falling more and more in love with the lover of my soul. And what does he do? He transformed me. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not holding myself up as an example. That's just been my experience. But I wanna, I wanna free us from this burden of guilt that, that, that wants to tackle the long laundry list. And I'm not giving you permission to sin. But I'm saying before you go after changing yourself, just go after the heart of God and allow God the Holy Spirit to change you. I don't know where I am in my notes this morning. <laughs> Deborah, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> Deborah's interpreting our Spanish service right now and looking at my notes that I am nowhere near at the moment. So bless their hearts. Um, let's pick up in verse four of chapter five. <laughs> I'll get the email later. For, for everyone who has been born of God, although she loves it, I just I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to pay. It's certainly not a picture. Mauricio gave me a hard time. <laughs> for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Here it is. It's our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son? Of God. I love this. We see this word three times in this section. Overcomes, overcomes, overcomes. We see the word victory. What is it? What is the big picture here? It's God's heart and desire for us to overcome what we were. And how do we do that? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone, as the only means of our salvation. And when we do that, He transforms us, right? We don't engage as Christians into behavior modification, but this journey of faith is one of transformation. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, our work in our lives. When we understand the relationship between love and obedience, then obedience becomes certainly more attainable and a whole lot more desirable. Why? Because it's driven out of a heart and the desire to please God. Our humanity doesn't want to obey, does it? Our flesh wants to secure our rights, wants to ensure our own freedoms, but the reality is obedience is what sets the stage for true freedom and true, and true blessing. This, this holding back, this, this lack of obedience and a desire to preserve oneself is the very thing that keeps us from walking in the freedom and the joy and the blessing that God has for us. We say, no, I can't be vulnerable. I can't obey in this area. I've got to be strong. I gotta, I gotta hold this against them. I can't obey in this area and that is the very thing that's keeping us from walking in the freedom that God wants us to walk in there is the ability to overcome as we place our faith in him God takes obedience very serious because it's an outward expression of our hearts obedience is an outward expression of of our hearts. We learn this, the seriousness of, of obedience in the, in the story of King Saul. Uh, we're going to take a look at that this morning and just take a look at um, Saul's. Uh, um, Saul was the, the king of Israel. And if you, if you want to turn your Bibles, that's 1 Samuel chapter 15. I believe it'll be up on the screen ahead, behind me. But um, we see here the, the high priority, the premium that God places on obedience. And in this particular case, we see that Saul is rejected as being a king because of his disobedience to God. 
First Samuel chapter 15 opens up by um, uh, Samuel coming. Samuel is the prophet uh, of Israel. He comes to Saul, who is the king of Israel, and reminds him that the Lord had sent, hey, listen, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people. You remember that? Yeah, we do remember that. And then he proceeds to instruct him on striking the hand of the Amalekites, the people of Amalek, those who were in, 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 in rebellion and, and, and uh, sinf- in, in, in sinful ways. And God is very specific with King Saul. He is to totally wipe out the land. Every person, every ox, every sheep, every camel, every donkey, they are to take nothing from the, the land of Amalek. You are to destroy it all. Leave it there. It's all tainted with sin. Stay away from it. Do you understand, Saul? Yes, I understand. We pick up in verse seven. It says here that, and Saul defeated the Amalekites. Then he took, verse eight, he took Agag, the king, of the Amalekites, he brought him, instead of killing him like he was supposed to, he brought him alive. And then he devoted destruction to all of the people by the edge of the sword. Verse nine, but Saul and the people, who? Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the best of the oxen and the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. They got in the land, they had clear mission from God and they had a change of plans. They're like, you know what? Listen, here's what we're gonna do. Take the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, don't kill it, that'd be a waste. Let's save that for ourselves. That's exactly what they did. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, again, the prophet. And God said, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and he has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. Verse 12, and Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Isn't it interesting? Saul sees the, pre, the, 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 the priest come, Samuel, and he makes a beeline for it. God bless you, man. It's so good to see you. I have performed what the Lord has called me to do. And Samuel said, if you had done that, then what is this bleating of the sheep in my ears? Why do I hear the sheep? Why do I hear the oxen here? And Saul said, look, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Did you catch the the, the flip-flop right there? We see clearly in the beginning, he called for it. Now he got called on the carpet. It's not his fault. Wasn't me. They brought it. Kind of sounds like Adam, right? Wasn't me. The woman made me eat this, right? And he does the exact same thing here. He says, look, they have brought from the, them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the ox, oxen, and they're gonna do it to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He's kind of building this lie as he goes. He's building this plane in the air right now, and he's just kind of trying to get out of the situation that he's in. And he did this to sacrifice to the Lord, look, your God. Not the Lord my God. We're getting a little insight to where Saul is at at this point. And the rest we have, the rest we've devoted to destruction. And then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? In other words, you're responsible. The Lord anointed you king over Israel And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, devote to destruction of the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. And here's the question. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Who, what, why 
did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you, why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the best of the things devoted to destruction, and they are to sacrifice it to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Do you see the compromise? And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow, what an incredible premium that we see that God places on obedience. Does the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he does in obeying the voice of the Lord? A couple of things we see in this exchange is as hard as it may be to reconcile this in our minds, we see the priority of obedience over sacrifice. The priority of, of obedience over sacrifice. We see three things in this, in this section in, in, in Saul's response and disobedience to the Lord. The first thing we see here is that King Saul's disobedience to God's command revealed a heart of disobedience. He didn't just have an action of disobedience, he had a heart of disobedience. It wasn't just the action that caused, see, because here's the deal, actions will always follow the heart. That's exactly what we see taking place in Saul. We see a heart of disobedience followed by the actions of disobedience. Another thing we see here, very important, is that God values obedience more than religious activity and sacrifices. God values obedience more than religious activity and sacrifices. Saul thought that he could get away with disobedience by, by spinning it into an act of worship. Yeah, we didn't obey, but you know what? We're gonna sacrifice it to the Lord. I didn't obey you, but you know what? I, I'm gonna, I got a better plan in place. No, God meant what he said, and he, and he said what he meant. Here's, here's the real problem with Saul. Saul came to God on his own terms. Saul knew what he was supposed to do. He just felt like he knew better. I see Christians do it all the time. In my 34 years of walking, I've seen so many Christians that I think to myself, why would you do this? It's so clear that we're not supposed to engage in this area, act in this way, participate in this thing. That's so inconsistent with who we are in Christ. I know, but... Now, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want them to think I'm holier than thou, and so I'll just be like them. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but, you know, hey, it's 2023. No, to obey is better than sacrifice. And you see, the problem is Saul came to God on his own terms. Hey, God, I'll come to you. If you do this, respond that way. Give me this. As long as you, we have, in other words, God, I'm calling the shots. And as long as you meet me where I'm at, I'll give you my life. And you see, what, you know what obedience does? Obedience reminds us that he is the potter and we are the clay. He is God and we are not. He is the creator and we are the creation. He sets the rules and we are just to Obey them. Now we are to do that <laughs> out of love for God. Why does God set the rules? Out of love for us. God's not trying to keep bad things from us. Well, actually, God's not trying to keep good things from us, right? He's looking to keep bad things from us. 
And so his commandments are for our good. He, those, these commandments are so that we can walk in the goodness and blessing that God has designed for us to walk in. So we don't want to be guilty of what Saul is guilty of. Laying the terms down for our obedience and making it user-friendly along the way. The third thing we see here is our love for God should manifest in heartfelt obedience not mere external actions, right? Our love for God should manifest itself in, in heartfelt obedience, not just in external actions. It is the heart that God looks upon, not our activity, as we saw in Saul. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's not like Jesus is twisting anybody's arms. This is Jesus presenting the relationship between love and obedience. They are inseparable. As we look at in Revelation chapter two, when Jesus is addressing the churches, he addresses the church at Ephesus, right? And, and what was the problem in the church at Ephesus? Well, they had all the right doctrine, they had all the right works, they were doing all the right stuff. Jesus just said, here's the one thing I have against you. You left me your first love. I'm less concerned with what you do and I'm more concerned with your love for me. And Jesus puts on clear um, um, notice the relationship between love and obedience. The fourth point I wanna bring to you this morning is this, that Jesus is our example. Jesus, Jesus never calls us to do something he hasn't done himself. Jesus is our example. Listen to him in John chapter eight. He says, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as the father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Look, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's what Jesus said about his father. I always do the things. Why? Because he loves the father. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John chapter 14, verse 31. Jesus said, but I do as the father has commanded me so the world may know that I love the father. Love and obedience, inseparable. John chapter 15 and verse nine, Jesus says this, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. There's the relationship again. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. That's the example. And so Jesus isn't calling us to do anything that he hasn't done himself. We are to hold in proper tension and see the relationship between love and love. In obedience. Let's go back to our text. Just as we saw Jesus' obedience to the Father born out of love, likewise we see Jesus' obedience to coming to us born out of love as well, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? So the Father sends the Son, and the Son comes willingly. Out of love for the Father and out of love for, for you and me. Let's continue. John highlights this. As we get to verse six, he begins to highlight the, the deity of Christ. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Doesn't that, that just sums it all up for us, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem like you just like made a left turn somewhere? And like, what, where'd that come from, right? What, what, is, what is John saying here? There's been a lot of speculation about what is meant here by the, the water and the blood. And, and a lot of people assume that what this is referring to was that moment where the centurion cast his spear into the side of Jesus and, and blood and water flowed when Christ was on the cross. It's important to us, for us to remember that the purpose of the writing of this book was to highlight the deity of Christ, to demonstrate to his readers that Christ is very God of very God, and a spear being lunged into the side of Jesus just doesn't do that. So why? Well, what is he referring to? He's referring to baptism 
And he's referring to his death, Jesus' baptism and Jesus' death. The water refers to, to baptism. And it's at that moment where, again, as, as Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, right, we see the Spirit of God descending in the, in the form of a dove, and we hear the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John is showing that at, through, through baptism that the deity of Christ is substantiated. And then the blood refers to his death. At the moment of Christ's death, the, 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 it says that the earth went dark. Mark records that the graves began to open up and dead people started walking around. Could you imagine what that must have been like, right? And then finally, as the centurion declared, truly this is the Son of God. So much went on in that moment that declared the deity of Christ. These two events, his baptism and his death, serve as the bookends to Jesus' earthly ministry. And John is holding this up as an expression of love and obedience of Christ in Christ coming to the earth. He came, he lived, he served, and he died for you and for me. And John points out the Holy Spirit testifies to these truths. We need not listen to anyone else's opinion, is what John is saying, especially the false teachers that were creeping into the churches and stirring things up. He says this in verse nine, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater than that. In other words, don't listen to them. Man, remember what happened at his baptism. Remember what happened at his death. Remember how the spirit of God bears witness to the fact that this is the Christ. The testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because not, he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. What is he talking about? He's talking about the spirit of God that was, that's within the body of Christ that bears witness that says, yes, he is the son of God. And so we have the, the, the baptism of Jesus, we have the death of Jesus, and we have the Spirit of God within us that John holds up and says, these three testify that Jesus is God, very God of very God. Why would we listen to anybody else? And then he goes to, very, our last point is this, I'm gonna wrap it up with this. Number, number five, we see John highlights the assurance of eternal life the assurance of eternal life. Look at verse 11. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. John reiterates that, that eternal life is directly connected to the Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way. There is no other path. Jesus is the only way for man to get to God. He that has the Son has life. And he who does not have a Son does not have life. John reiterates that in John chapter three, verse 36, where he says, he that has the son has life, and he, who does not have, he that does not have the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so the only way to experience life is in the son. Eternal life is connected to Jesus and Jesus alone. And so we see the relationship between love and obedience. They are, they are inseparable. It is our love for God that compels us to, to diligently obey him. And in so doing, we demonstrate our faith and our devotion and our love for God. God is not looking for sacrifice just for the purpose of sacrifice. He's looking for obedience compelled by love. And when we walk in obedience, loving God, loving others, as a manifestation of embracing the Son, John says we have the assurance of eternal life because it's directly tied to the Son. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you sent the Son because there was no other way that we can be reconciled back to you. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you came, that you lived and you died for us. As my sister shared this morning, if that was all you did, Lord, that was more than enough. We didn't deserve any of that. God, you're so good to us. I just pray, Lord, that we never get caught up in the the do's and don'ts of Christianity, the rules and regulations, that we would elevate our faith to a, a set of rules. That's not what you've called us to but you invited us to engage in relationship with the lover of our souls. And as we do that, we are transformed more and more into your image. And Father, for those who who don't know you, those who have not embraced the Son, those who are relying on anything other than, than Christ and Christ alone, I pray that they not leave this place this morning without embracing you, turning from their sins, and putting their trust in you and you alone is the only means of their salvation. If that's you this morning, I encourage you to come on, on up afterwards and pray with our team that'll be up here. Father, we thank you for the free gift of, of eternal life that's in the Son. In Christ's name we pray, amen.